uh, we, we were <coughs> working our way through the Jewish year, and uh, we got to we got to Shavuot, right? Cheesecake. Yeah. <laughs> we got to do this. The, the only way to get people to remember is to do it via food, yeah. right? So we spoke about Pesach, which is matzah. Then we talked all about Shavuot, which is cheesecake. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we're going to do when we talk about Tisha B'Av. I've got no idea because you can't eat anything at all. But uh, <clears throat> I don't know no how food. how's anyone going to remember that. No food. I'm sure that'll. Drop they'll, re remember. they'll remember that. Yeah. They'll remember that. Okay. Shavuot is in the month of Sivan. <coughs> and again, we're moving moving into moving into the summer the summer months. So after after Shavuot, what comes next? So from Sivan, we go into Tammuz. Tammuz again. We're going now into the heart of the summer. Tammuz, the, the only thing that Tammuz has in it, uh, month-wise, Jewish-wise, is a little, bit of, a little bit of a negative thing. It's a little bit of a bad thing. We've got the Shiva Saba Tammuz, which is the 17th of Tammuz. The uh, 17th of Tammuz is a, the day, what, one of the first days in the year. Um, it's a day that commemorates the breaching of the walls around Jerusalem. Um, again, if you've been to the old city, so you're, you're aware of what the walls look like. Breaching the walls was a pretty big thing because they're very thick. And uh, when the Romans finally were able to punch a hole through them, then that was really the bit, very much the beginning of the end. Three weeks later, it ended up with the destruction of the temple. And the 17th of Tammuz brings us into a three-week period of mourning. Um, it's a, you know, a difficult period inside of Jewish history, actually. It's a, a period that's always had all kinds of difficulties that have uh, rolled around together with it. Um, and the, uh, what do we do? So for the first, the first part of the three weeks, we, uh, you know, we don't eat, we don't listen to music, don't get a haircut, don't okay. shave, right? Which for some of you obviously isn't such a big deal. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but <coughs> one, once we finish up with the month of Tammuz and we move into the month of Av, then at that point things become a little bit more extreme. So when we get into the month of Av, then we stop eating meat as well, except for Shabbat. On Shabbat you can eat as much meat as you want. Um, we don't eat meat, and uh, there's they're sort of like bathing restrictions, washing clothes restrictions, restrictions uh, and all of that is going to keep going until the 9th of Av. And the 9th of Av, 9th of Av is the, the culmination of, of many, many uh, difficult times inside of Jewish history. Um, it commemorates the destruction of both the temples. Um, it commemorates all kinds of things, actually. The, uh, the Spanish Inquisition took place on the, uh, the expulsion from Spain took place on the, on the 9th of Av. The First World War actually broke out on the 9th of Av as well. Um, anyone who's familiar with European history, so you know that the First World War is re really the precursor to the Second World War and the Holocaust, um, the aftermath of the First World War is what led to all kinds of, all kinds of nationalistic movements inside of, uh, inside of Germany, which culminated, of course, with Hitler, the rise of Hitler and Nazism. Um, it's, 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 it's an awful day. It's a day which it's the only, there are only two days in the year when we fast for 25 hours, and the 9th of Av is one of them. <coughs> Regular fasts go from the dawn until nightfall, right? So in the winter, that's reasonably short. In the summer, it's a little bit longer. Um, but on Tisha B'Av, on the 9th of Av, we fast from sunset all the way through until nightfall the next day. Um, there are all kinds, of, all kinds of things that will happen. That everything is very different on Tisha B'Av. So for example, we're not supposed to wear leather shoes. We go to shul, we sit on the floor in shul. The, uh, the, uh, the curtain in front of the oren, in front of the ark, is removed. Some of the lights are switched off in order to make things a little bit more somber. <coughs> and uh, after, after davening, after the, after the regular mariv prayers, we then sit down and the Megillah of Eicha is read. Now, Eicha is a, I guess the west, best way to describe it is it's a dirge. It was written by Jeremiah, by Yeremiah. <clears throat> and it's a uh, it's 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 it makes for very very depressing reading. It's got its own tune that goes together with it. It's a, a rather mournful tune, uh, and after that, <clears throat> some slichot, some lamentations are read, <clears throat> and then uh, and then go home. <clears throat> There's not very much you can do on Tisha B'av. We're, we're not allowed. We're not even allowed to learn Torah on Tisha B'av. 
It's a real, it's a real rough day. I mean, maybe for you people it sounds like it's a little bit more exciting, but uh, <laughs> not being able to learn Torah is a uh, is an indication of just how bad things are. The only other time that we don't learn Torah is when somebody is sitting shiva for a loved one, somebody's passed away. So then the person who's sitting shiva is not supposed to learn Torah either. Um, an indication of just how how mournful, how how uh, bad Tisha B'av is the ninth of Av. <clears throat> uh, in the morning, we get up. It's very strange in the morning. We go to shul. We do not put on tefillin. So we pray shacharit. We pray the morning service. <clears throat> and then we sit down back on the floor again. And there's a, a large amount of what are called kinot, lamentations, which are recited. If you read them through, some of them are very beautiful. Some of them are very poetic. But they all share the same theme. They're all, they're all very... Uh, they're all very depressing. They talk about destruction, death, destruction, things that have happened to the Jewish nation over the various times. So it talks about the destruction of the temple, of course. It talks about the various exiles that the Jews have gone into. It talks about the Crusades. There are uh, contemporary kinot that have been written about the Holocaust. Um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very, very difficult time. Um, paradoxically, at midday on Tisha B'av, from midday onwards, things become a little less difficult, which means that we can start sitting down in regular chairs again. <clears throat> we put the, the curtain back on in front of the ark. Um, <clears throat> we, at Mincha time, we put on our tefillin. We haven't worn our tefillin in the morning, we put them on in the afternoon instead. Uh, <clears throat> and it's interesting because the rabbis say <clears throat> that on the 9th of Av, from Midday onwards, the temple went up in flames, which they set the, the, the uh, <coughs> conquering army set the temple on fire at midday, and yet that's the time that we become a little less stringent in our morning practices. And the rabbis explain that this is a very, very fascinating idea that with the destruction of the temple, it's clear that God is going to destroy the Jewish temple, but he's not going to destroy the Jewish people. So within the most difficult moment of history, we have the knowledge that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that God is still looking after us, that He's going to take care of us. And one of the kinot, one of the lamentations that's recited, it's called Mizmor La'asaf, it's called a song to Asaf, and it talks about the destruction of the temple, and the Gemara itself in the Talmud, they ask a very simple question. They say, Mizmor La'asaf, surely it should say, Kina la'asaf, a lamentation to ourselves. Why are we calling it a mizmor? And the Gemara answers, and just what I told you, the Gemara says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God is, 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 is uh, allowing his, his anger to come out over a building made out of sticks and stones and the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, however, will continue, which means that within the darkest, darkest moment, there is always that glimmer of light. There's always that glimmer of hope that things are going to be okay. Um, after the 9th of Av, the next day, the 10th of Av, we've still got a residue of morning practices, uh, so we're not, not supposed to eat meat until midday on the 10th of Av, we're not supposed to do laundry until midday on the 10th of Av, we're not supposed to get our hair cut or shave until midday on the 10th of Av, and after that, things start settling down back into normal. <clears throat> In the middle of Av, the middle of the month of Av, there is something called Tuba Av, Tuba Av is a rather fascinating little day. It's considered to be a joyous day. It's a day, for example, where within inside of the prayers we don't say Tachnun. Tachnun is the prayers that are recited that commemorate the destruction. Um, on special days we don't say Tachnun. So on Rosh Chodesh we don't say Tachnun. On Shabbos we don't say Tachnun. Bless Thank you. you. Tuba Av, in, in Talmudic times, in biblical times, Tuba Av was a rather fascinating day. It was a day when the girls used to go out into the vineyards and uh, everyone used to get, all the girls used to get dressed up in the same kind of clothing so it was difficult to differentiate, you know, who, who was who and what was what. And the, the boys would go out and they would watch the girls as they were, as they were dancing around and then the, that's how Shiduchim were made. So, you know, you would see a girl and you say, I want to, I, I would like to go out with her and then that's what would happen. Many, many, many uh, marriages you know, came from Tuba Av, and it's considered to be a very, a very joyous day to the point where the 
Gemara says, Chazal say, the sages say, that there are two days in the year that are of paramount joy, the, 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 most, the most joyous days in the year, and one of them is Yom Kippur, and the other one is Tuba Av, right, the 15th of Av. And uh, it's a rather, a rather strange reaction. Uh, if anybody understands what Yom Kippur is all about, really understands what Yom Kippur is about, and so it's easy to understand why Yom Kippur might be the most joyous day in the year. It's a day of, of purity, it's a day of atonement, it's a day of repentance, it's a, something which brings us into a very, a very special state of being. But uh, Tuba'av seems to be like a rather, it seems like a, a rather minor day in order for the Mishnah to come out and say such an extraordinary statement that with, together with Yom Kippur, it is the most joyous days of the year. Uh, so I once heard a fascinating explanation that, uh, that uh, all the other festivals that we've got, all the other days that we have during the year, they're commemorating something which took place and we are building on that thing that happened in the past. So for example, we spoke about Pesach, right? God took us out of Egypt, therefore we commemorate Pesach, we celebrate Pesach, right? But it happened because of something that happened in the past. We spoke about Shavuot, again, it's the same kind of an idea. We celebrate the fact that we have the Torah every day we have the Torah, but we celebrate the fact that it was given to us 3,300 years ago. That's when we first got it. However, Yom Kippur and Tu Ba'av are two days that are pointing only into the future. They're not, they're not based, they're not built on something which took place in the past. Yom Kippur, again, we're talking about atonement, repentance, looking into the future in a state of purity. And Tu Ba'av, which is a concept of marriage, is the idea of looking into the future together with your beloved spouse, No reaction. Okay. Together with your beloved spouse, and uh, it's, it's all about what's going to be in the future. It's not built on something on the past, which is a very fascinating idea, this idea of, of, uh, of truly joyous occasions being things that, that project us into the future in a state of purity and in a state of joy. Um, after, after the month of Av, now we're right in, the, right in the middle of the summer now. The month of Av normally falls out in July and August. Uh, and then we move from Av, we move into one of, the, one of the most important months of the year, which is the month of Elul. Now, Elul doesn't have anything inside of it. There's no, there's no festival inside of Elul. However, Elul is the month that builds up to Rosh Hashanah, which is the month that comes after Elul is Tishrei. Tishrei is the month that has Rosh Hashanah inside of it. And Elul is a month that's been dedicated to preparing ourselves for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So that means like this. Where, where's Mo oh, Moshe's left, right? No wonder he left. He didn't want to hear this, that's for sure. <laughs> the, uh, there is a custom to recite slichot, which are penitent prayers in the month of Elul. If you are Ashkenazi, so it's not so complicated. It's normally four days before Rosh Hashanah. That's when the slichot begin. They start on Saturday night on Motzei Shabbat, which means that if Rosh Hashanah is close to Motzei Shabbat, less than four days before, they start reciting. We start reciting the Sinichot a week before, but it's not, it's not a real big deal. The uh, Sfadim, on the other hand, start reciting Sinichot from the beginning of Elul. And the Sfadi Sinichot are very long. And the custom is for many Sfadim to get up at midnight and to start reciting them. And if not at midnight, then at least just before the dawn, just, be, just before the sunup, in order to pray together with the sunup. And it's every single day, and it's a lot of work, it really is. It's a very, it's a very intensive month of preparation. I once got into a taxi, it was Elul, and I once got into a taxi outside of the yeshiva, and uh, the, the taxi driver, it's really, it's a quite a fascinating story. The taxi driver was... Not, not, a, not an orthodox looking person at all. He was, didn't have his head covered and he was wearing a t-shirt, a pair of shorts, it's the middle of the summer. And uh, we get into the car, he was a Sfadi. We get into the car, I get into the car, and as we're driving along, he says to me, no, he says, are you, get, are you getting ready for Rosh Hashanah? Are you ready? So I said to him, you know, like a throwaway thing, I said, you know, how does, how does one get ready? Like, 
you know, imagining that I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know anything, right? So what, I'm going to get involved in some kind of a big discussion over here? No, right? So uh, he looks at me in the, in, the, in the mirror. He looks at me, he says to me, uh, what do you mean, how do you get ready? He said, have you started saying slichot yet? So the truth is, it was like, it was, it was a week before Rosh Hashanah and I hadn't, we hadn't started saying slichot yet. So I said, well, no, not yet. <laughs> so he looks at me, this complete, completely non-orthodox looking fellow, right? He looks at me and he says, uh, well, he says, how on earth can you be ready for Rosh Hashanah if you don't recite Slichot? So I, I'm like, you know, beginning, beginning to sort of like shrivel up a little bit. And then he says to me, you know, he says, uh, I get up at three o'clock every morning and I go to synagogue and we start reciting Slichot at 3.30 in the morning. And then at about 4.15, we put on our talit nut fill-in and we start praying. He says, and I pray with the, I pray with the nates with the sun up every morning. And then I come home and I have a little bit to eat. And then I go out to work. He says, uh, he says I, I feel like I'm getting ready for Rosh Hashanah. He says, what about you? So this is like complete role reversal, right? You know, here am I, this uh, big, important rabbi sitting in the back of this taxi being, being put into my place by, by this taxi driver who doesn't, doesn't even, doesn't look orthodox, right? And I, I don't know what to tell, what am I supposed to tell him? So I start explaining to him because in the Ashkenazi custom, he says, uh, in the Ashkenazi custom, we start saying four days before Rosh Hashanah because when a, when a, when a uh, sacrifice was brought to the temple, so it was left for four days before it was offered up in order to be able to be checked to make sure I had no blemishes. <laughs> so I told him that that's why we wait till four days before. We're like, we're like the korban, we're like the sacrifice that's being brought to the temple and we've got to make sure we're checking for blemishes. So I thought, I thought I'd like, you know, that it sounded okay, right? And Baruch Hashem, we got to where we were going to. And... Uh, as, you know, he didn't say very much after that, but as, as I'm getting out of the cab, he says to me, uh, like he like shakes his head, you know, and he says, he says, I don't know, he says, if you don't, if you don't say Slichot, he says, I don't know how you think you can get yourself ready for Rosh Hashanah. It was, it was like a, like a real, it was a real lesson, it really was, that, uh, <clears throat> that there's, more, there's more to getting ready for Rosh Hashanah than just reciting Slichot, that's for sure, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty integral part of what's going on, it's, like I said before, it's pretty labor-intensive. Um, if you are uh, Sfadi, then it's very labor-intensive. If you're Ashkenazi, then it's, you know, the, the week before Rosh Hashanah, it starts becoming more and more, you know, there's, there's more and more anticipation for Rosh Hashanah itself. Um, what is Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah, of course, is the beginning of the year for the days. We spoke about the idea of there being two beginnings. There's Rosh Hashanah for the months and there's Rosh Hashanah for the days. Rosh Hashanah for the months is Nisan and Rosh Hashanah for the days is Tishrei. The month of Tishrei kicks off with Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is two days. It's two days wherever you are, right? It doesn't matter whether you're here in Israel or whether you're outside of Israel. It's two days for everybody. And uh, Rosh Hashanah is the commemoration of the creation of Adam, right? The function, one of the functions of Rosh Hashanah is to crown God as the king over ourselves. And obviously if God is king, then we really need to do what God wants us to do. Uh, and all of that is happening on the day that Adam, the first, the first human being, was created. Um, and the idea is very clear because until Adam came into the world, so there is nobody to crown God as the king. Once there's somebody here in the world, then we have the ability to be able to crown God. And that Rosh Hashanah is the coronation day of Adam. Um, Rosh Hashanah is replete. First of all, prayers on Rosh Hashanah are extremely lengthy. Um, the, prayer, the prayers on Erev Rosh Hashanah, certainly for the Ashkenazim, are very, very lengthy because we're trying to cram in a month's worth of slichot into that we haven't said, get them all crammed into the day before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, there is a custom among some people to fast half a day on Erev Rosh Hashanah. That's because on Rosh Hashanah itself you can't fast, even though Rosh Hashanah is considered to be a day of judgment and it's a day that maybe we should be, we should be fasting, but because it's a Yom Tov day, 
so we're not allowed to fast. So some people have the custom to fast for half a day before Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. Why would they have the custom to fast before Rosh Hashanah? It's as if, it's as if you're, you're saying that I really <coughs> should be fasting tomorrow, but because I'm not allowed to, so I'm going to, I'm going to take upon myself now just to have a half a day fast now. Right, but why would they fast? Why would they fast? Because, I mean, I go, it's like in a sense of trying to make up for not being able to fast on Rosh Hashanah. So why would they fast on Rosh Hashanah, I think is what you're yeah. Ah, that's what you're asking? Yeah. So why'd you say that? <laughs> I don't know which is more disturbing, the fact that he was so vague or the fact that you understood it. That's, yeah. that's disturbing, that, that, for sure. Gosh, okay. Uh, I hope you don't push each other off. That's... Uh, um, the, the, uh, why, why should we be fasting on Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah is called the Yom Adin. It's a day of judgment. So really on Rosh Hashanah, we should be coming into Rosh Hashanah in the same way that you go into Yom Kippur, full of, full of, uh, full of uh, you know, awe, <laughs> full, full of awe, somewhat, somewhat concerned about the outcome of whatever is going to happen on Rosh Hashanah, right? And, uh, but Rosh Hashanah has been given to us, though, the way, the way that it's described in the Torah, it's a Yom Tov. So on Rosh Hashanah, we have to treat it like a Yom Tov. We have to eat, we have to drink. Um, and therefore, we, we don't fast, even though we really should be fasting. And that's where the, the half-day fast, the day before, is just coming to try to, you know, try, I don't know, maybe try to put us into the right frame of mind. Um, <coughs> bless you. Bless you. <coughs> it came out finally. <coughs> there's a, uh, there's a, a, <coughs> a beautiful little disagreement <coughs> between the various, some, some various rabbis, <coughs> the, uh, wh whether one should cry on Rosh Hashanah or not. Rosh Hashanah is a Yom Adin, it's a day of judgment. On a day of judgment, you know, it's a day to be full of, of fear for the outcome of the judgment. And, uh, you know, to cry, to try to, to try to sort of like evoke a certain sense of, of, uh, of uh, you know, of feeling awe and anticipation in the day. Uh, others say that you're not supposed to cry on Rosh Hashanah because it's the day of the coronation of God. So it's a, it's a joyous day and not a day that should, we should be crying over. Rav Yisrael Salanta, the, uh, the founder of what's called the Musa movement, which is the, uh, the movement that's trying to make us into better people, so he's got, he says the most incredible thing. This is a real classic Musa approach. He says that if you feel like you want to cry on Rosh Hashanah, then you shouldn't. And if you feel like you don't want to cry on Rosh Hashanah, then you should. And the idea of, of, uh, of trying to... Don't look, don't look so uh, confused. The, the idea of trying to, to overcome our n natural, normal reactions to things in order to be more tapped into the spiritual dimensions of who we are. Um, in all events, Rosh Hashanah, so Friday, you know, on, on Rosh Hashanah night, the davening is relatively short. We then go home. Now, on Rosh Hashanah night, <clears throat> there's a very famous custom to eat something called simanim. The simanim are different kinds of foods that represent different things. The most famous of all, of course, is the apple and the honey. Um, mm. mm, look at that. We finally got a reaction. Talk about food, and we get a reaction. Good. Um, the, uh, the apple and the honey, of course, is the, uh, is the, the, mo the most famous symbol <laughs> together with the shofar of <clears throat> Rosh Hashanah. Uh, we dip our apple in the honey that we should have a sweet year. Um, the, uh, there are other, there are other simonim as well. So that amongst the Yerushalmi, when I was growing up as a kid, we just, at home, we just had three things. We had apple and honey, we had challah and honey, and we had pomegranates. Those were the three standard things that we had when I was growing up. But over here in Israel, it's, it's certainly amongst the Yerushalmi, amongst the Jerusalem, the people that, you know, what are called the Yerushalmi Jews, they've got a whole series, you know, like, you know, 8, 10, 15 different kinds of foods that they eat that are centered around different, different prayers that are recited inside of the meal. Um, that it should be a good year, it should be a sweet year, that we should, you know, our, our uh, enemies should be taken away from us. All different kinds of, of, uh, of things that we pray for that are represented by various foods that we eat. Um, there is a custom to eat honey with your challah. There's actually a custom to eat honey with all bread, any bread that you eat, not just on Rosh Hashanah, but throughout the whole period, up to and including the end of Sukkot. Um, 
And the, uh, the reason for that, again, there's a, there's a custom to recite a little prayer. We say, you're at that we should have a Shana Tova Umutuka. It should be a good, sweet year. And I saw once many years ago, I think, I think, it, in, I think Rabbi Yonasan Ibishitz, who says that we, we say it over and over again because the more that we say it, hopefully the truer it will become which means that uh, there's a sen- sense of sweetness that our year, a year should be a sweet year, it should be a good year, it should be a year where we see, where we, we are able to see the goodness and the sweetness and not just rely on the fact that everything that God does is for the good, even if we don't see, even if we can't identify it very clearly. Um, Rosh Hashanah in the morning, so davening is very long. Right, inside of davening, what have we got? We've got, first of all, we've got a very, very lengthy repetition of the Amida at Musaf time, which is a, the second Amida that's, that's davening in the morning. Uh, but we also have before that the blowing of the shofar. Blowing of the shofar is the most central dimension of Rosh Hashanah. The blowing of the shofar is something which is very, very evocative, very poignant. Um, the blowing of the shofar, according to some of the rabbis, that the Sheh Mishmur, one of the Hasidic Rebbe's, says something very interesting about the blowing of the shofar. He says that, you know, we all of us have emotions inside of us that are so deeply set that we can't, we can't verbalize. It's impossible to turn them into something which has got a, a, a verbal description to them. And he says that the blowing of the shofar is that primordial sense of, of what's inside of me wanting to come out and to join me together with God. Um, it's a, very, it's a very, very important moment inside of the prayers. It's also the most central part of the davening on Rosh Hashanah. Um, you know, as a kid, we, we waited to be able to listen to the shofar being blown. The last shofar blast is called a tekiah gadola. When we were children, we had to count how many seconds the fellow could keep blowing his, yeah, I guess, keep, keep blowing his shofar. Um, it was something, you know, something, it was a great, a great moment <clears throat> see if he was going to beat the record from the year before or not. The problem was nobody actually remembered how long he did it for the year before, so each year was its own record, which is great. Um, the, uh, within, within davening, um, again, there's a lot, a lot of prayers that are being said. It's a very, it's a very intensive, very intense time. Right? In, in the synagogue, you're there for a long time. Um, some synagogues actually make a break between before the shofar is blown in order to have a little kiddish because it's going to be such a long day that uh, people, you know, Kalina again, we're Jewish, right? We shouldn't go too long without eating any food because uh, that would be a calamity. Be a shame. For sure. <clears throat> um, some people have the custom to wear white on Rosh Hashanah, what's called a kittel. Um, some, some people, again, you're going to shul, you'll probably see some people wearing, some people not wearing. Whatever you do, it's going to be fine. It's absolutely fine. <clears throat> after, after the prayers on Rosh Hashanah in the morning, everyone goes home. They have a, a meal, a, a regular Yom Tov meal. Um, you know, normally, uh, get, normally some people have the, the custom to eat sweet things on Rosh Hashanah. So they might cook their chicken in a sweet sauce. Uh, there'll be, you know, side dishes that, you know, sometimes, for example, side dishes like timis, which are made with, with, uh, with, uh, with something sweet, whatever. You know, again, whatever you do, it's fine. Whatever you eat, it's going to be fine as well. Uh, there is also a custom on Rosh Hashanah in the afternoon to recite something called Tashlich. <clears throat> tashlich is a very interesting prayer. Uh, some people have the custom to go down to a body of water and to recite the prayer of Tashlich over the body of water. Right? And they take, they empty out their, their uh, pockets if they have any crumbs in their pockets, they send them out into the water for the fish to be able to eat. It's symbolic of getting rid of your sins. Some people have the custom not to go to a body of water, they should stay at home and they recite the tefillah of Tashlich at home without going to any water. My, my family custom is not to go to a body of water, we stay at home and we recite it at home. But my parents, when they first moved into the area that they lived in for, you know, for 40 years plus, so they decided that it was just before Rosh Hashanah and they moved in and they wanted to join the, you know, they joined the shul and they wanted to be a part of the, the, the communal events. So when everybody went down to the local river to do Tashlich, 
So they went together as well, together with everybody else. And my mother said that they all said Tashlich over there. And the next day, the river was closed due to pollution. So I don't know. I guess it was, it was full of everybody's sins. Um, whatever. The bottom line is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a long series of prayers. They're worth reading in English because they're very beautiful. Um, and it's, uh, you know, again, go to the water. Don't go to the water. The important thing over here is to say, that, to say the prayers in the right frame of mind, with the right kavanah, with the right intentions. <clears throat> Second day of Rosh Hashanah is similar to the first day of Rosh Hashanah. Um, the prayers are very long. The, uh, the uh, repetition of the Amida of Musaf time is very long. The shofar is blown again, right, on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And uh, again, it's a, you know, it's a, very, it's a very important day. They're called the days of awe. And, those, you know, they're really, that's really uh, the way that we're supposed to approach the, 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 that's really the way we're supposed to approach the avoida, the worship on Rosh Hashanah, that they are days of awe. We should take them very seriously. We should, uh, we should uh, you know, enjoy the opportunity to be able to stand in front of God for so long and to be able to pour out our hearts to Him. And uh, like I said, it's something we should, take, we should take it all very seriously. Yeah. Why are there two days? Why are there two days? The Gemara asked the same question. Um, why are there two days of Rosh Hashanah? So one of the reasons it's given, interestingly enough, uh, the Meiri says, one of the very early authorities, he says, because if you don't get it right the first day, then you can, <laughs> you've been given a second day to be able to get it right the second day. Which is an interesting idea. Again, <coughs> bless you. Well, what's, the, uh, what's the idea? The idea, I think, is that, that it's, such a, it's such an important day that we want to, <laughs> you to... The Gemara calls Rosh Hashanah, interesting, interesting enough, the Gemara calls Rosh Hashanah Yom Arichta. Yom Arichta means one long day. Uh, which means that even though it's two days, that the, the avoider of Rosh Hashanah is something which is considered to be one long, continuous, one long, continuous concept within which we have to work very hard in order to try to get to the levels that we need to get to. After Rosh Hashanah, we move into what are called the 10 days of repentance. Of course, the 10 days of repentance, that's really, it's really the wrong... It's the wrong, the wrong number, that's for sure, because the 10 days of repentance include the two days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which means that really you just have a week between the end of Rosh Hashanah and the beginning of Yom Kippur, and those are de days that are dedicated to trying to become better, trying to do tshuva, trying to repent, trying to atone. Um, for example, slichot that are recited in the mornings on the 10 days of repentance are much longer than they have been up until now. <coughs> we recite a series of prayers <coughs> called Avinu Malkenu. They all begin with the words Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, which kind of, that kind of uh, encapsulates the, the approach that we're supposed to have towards Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is our Father. First and foremost, He's our Father. But he's also our king, which means that we should love God the way that we love our fathers, but we should also be in awe of God in the way that we'd be in awe of a king. Um, and we work our ways up. Many people have the custom on, Russia, on their 10 days of repentance, many people have the custom to take upon themselves extra stringencies which they wouldn't normally do in order to try to, you know, just again to keep themselves concentrating on what it is that they're supposed to be doing to keep themselves in, you know, with their intentions pointed in the right direction. Um, there's a, a very interesting idea with inside of the halacha. It says that during Rosh Hashanah, a per, during, sorry, during the 10 days of repentance, a person should do their best to be more careful, to be more stringent with what they eat, for example. Right? Eat a person, you know, maybe, maybe uh, let's say, for example, a person is not so careful about dairy products. So during the 10 days of repentance, maybe it's a good idea to be a little bit more stringent, a little bit more careful. Um, there's a custom either in Elul or during the 10 days of repentance to have your mezuzot checked. Take them down, take them to somebody who can go through them and put them back up on the same day again. Uh, all these kinds of things that we're doing, again, why are we doing them? In order to keep ourselves directed 
in the way that we, that we want to be. We want to be more spiritual. We want to be more connected to God. We want to have that sense of a relationship, building up a relationship with God. All of that is going to be put into place. The foundations are going to be put, in, put into place in this period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, it's a very serious time of the year. And uh, again, it's all building up towards that Yom Kippur. The Shabbat before Yom Kippur, in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, is called Shabbat Shuva, or Shabbat Shuva, depends, either with a taf at the beginning or without. Uh, and it's the idea of the Shabbat of return. And again, what are we doing? We're trying to return back to God. There's a very old custom that the rabbis of the synagogues give very uh, give, give a, a very deep and detailed shear on Shabbat afternoon of Shabbat Shuva. Um, it's a, you know, again, it, go, don't go, but the, the shear is going to be taking place anyway. The, the writings of the rabbis, they say like this, something very fascinating. There's a week that gets you from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, that week in between, that gets you from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. And each one of those days of the week are going to be weighed up against all of those days, corresponding days in the year. So, for example, the Sunday of the 10 days of repentance, you can, with, with that Sunday, you can repent for all of the Sundays throughout the entire year prior to that. And on the Monday, and on the Tuesday, and on the Wednesday, and that Shabbat Tshuva is the ability to be able to repent and to atone for all the things that a person did wrong on all the Shabbatot of the year that has just passed us by. And it's the most incredible idea, which means this idea of being able to take care of the year with inside of each day. Right? So my, the Sunday will take care of all of my Sundays. Again, if I do it properly, I've, I've, got, to, I've got to be actively involved in the, in the process. <clears throat> the Monday will take care of all of the Mondays and the Tuesdays of all of the Tuesdays. And that way I can walk into Yom Kippur in a state of cleanliness and a state of purity in a way that otherwise I wouldn't be able to do. Just as an aside, um, you don't have to wait for Rosh Hashanah and the 10 days of repentance and Yom Kippur to repent. You know that. You can, you can repent at any time, on any day, and any month of the year. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is waiting for us to repent and to draw back to Him. But Rosh Hashanah, the 10 days of repentance and Yom Kippur, is a time that's been dedicated. It's like there's a fire sale going on, on repentance. And it's a lot easier to tap into it and to be able to utilize it and to enjoy it. There are 10 days of repentance. The Zohar says that the number 10 is a number of completion. It's, it's the, the everyth everything. Anything multiplied by 10 is the totality of that thing. So the 10 days of repentance, it's the totality of the ability to be able to repent and to atone in the way that we're supposed to do. And uh, yeah, I guess that's why there are 10 days of them. Thank you. Okay, we'll stop over here.